Um, we've got the pool slots, obviously, after this um, this evening. Uh, we split into kind of two two groups, an hour and an hour. Um, so we should be able to get most of the pool stuff done quite quickly. But again, that kind of comes down to people being around and people coming along when, when they say they can. Um, we've also got to do a swim test tonight. Uh, it's kind of an, it's an AU regulation thing. So it's not the BZAC or anything. We've got to do it for the union. Um, so you'll just have to swim. I think it's 200 metres. So it's quite a distance if you think really, but you doesn't have to take um, a time. You can kind of do it as long as long as you need. Take a lot of time to do it. Um, there should have been a form that went out uh, with all kind of to all the members. Just put for your details so we can kind of keep track of who's who and makes the everything a bit easier for us as instructors and keeping track of who's done what and what experience you've got. Uh, we're currently trying to organise also a trip from Go Dive to come to us. So they're a diving shop in Derby Way. Uh, they're, so they're not far from here. They would normally come in every year and you can buy some equipment that you'll need that you haven't, so you don't have to just use all the stuff in the kit store and then there's some things that you'll need to get as well for open water and stuff. So they normally they would come in at some point at least trying to book uh, an electric theatre for that. Um, but we've got a 10% discount, so if you need to buy stuff from them, we've got a code so you can buy it whenever you want. You don't have to buy it when they come, if you want to wait a little bit. We're trying to sort out some trips this year. Um, obviously, that is all COVID dependent. We're, we haven't been able to do all the trips we wanted to do. There's one that was meant to happen next week that's not happening. So it's we'll kind of, as things evolve and I think goes forward, we'll see what happens. But we'll keep you guys updated and just keep an eye out on the members page. If you should all be on that on Facebook um, and that will have any announcements about trips. Um, there's also with your BTEC membership, which you should all have got or you should have got. If you haven't got it, you would have got a reminder from Leo. Um, with that, you get access to all the resources online. So there's some videos, there's um, so, uh, more documentation just so you can read up of yourself or if you want to sometimes go over some of the lecture stuff that'd be on there as well Can I and now there? sorry um you should have all had an email saying to watch a video or two on the bees website has everyone actually done that can you just kind of put your hands up if you've done that in teams for us okay a couple of hands if if you haven't done that um after this lecture just before you head to the pool it's it's a quick video it's in your emails there's a link just go have a watch it basically just shows you how to put the kit together relatively quickly uh, and it'll just save us a bit of time tonight sorry james carry on yeah um and then once everything's kind of sorted out and we've worked it out you should be getting your training packs which will have all you have some like a, a diving manual so it's and the uh, course notes so you can self-study and read some if you miss something that actually you can read over it or if you want to look at something in more depth it'll be in the books there's your qualification records in there so we can keep an eye on what tr uh, training you've done um and then you, you use that through all your levels so it'd be quite it's quite useful thing to keep so that's all the housekeeping um let's get into why you're here for the uh, the diving stuff um so this module, we're kind of we're looking at the air, air and water pressure and the effects they have on us, the diver, while we're diving. Um, yeah, we'll have a look at that in a bit. We'll have a look at the um, snorkeling equipment and different equipment that can be used, so snorkeling and scuba. Um, and then looking at the buoyancy of us as a diver and how we can control it. And then we'll work on that tonight in the pool. And then there's also different types of thermal protection um, that we can use. So we'll get on to that in a bit. So, so air pressure, air is a gas that so can be compressed, um, it surrounds the earth and it puts a force on you in all directions. When you're on the surface, you've around, just standing around, you have what is called atmospheric pressure, um, which is just all the air above you basically pushing down and squeezing you. Um, it's equivalent to one bar, so it one it's like taking an area of a centimetre squared and it's like a force of a kilo put onto the air. Uh, Onto that area, so you you won't you don't really feel it. Um, but as we go deeper, we experience water pressure, which you do feel, um, or you start to feel anyway when you get a bit deeper. So as water is a non-compressible liquid, um, it's it's weight of the water kind of push, pushes in on you and increases the pressure. Um, so the weight of ten meters of water is equivalent to all of the air in the um, atmosphere. So you then, when you go down to 10 meters, 
you've got a pressure of one bar from the water and a pressure of one bar from the air. So that's then your water pressure is one bar, your air pressure is one bar. So your absolute pressure, which is what is the pressure you're experiencing, is two bar. Um, so when we kind of go forward with the trading, you will be look, we might start looking at pressures and you've always got to remember that as well as the water pressure, you've got the air pressure, which can be quite easy to forget. Um, it just kind of comes with practice, I guess. Um, and it's quite a useful thing to be able to remember to do. So yeah, at 10 meters depth, two, pressure, two bar is the absolute pressure. 20 meters, you've got pressure of three bar and 30 meters, you've got a pressure of four bar. So the pressure has different effects on the airspace. So um, it decreases the volume as the pressure increases. Um, this is quite important because obviously we're breathing air and air is going into some space in our lungs. So at, if we look at this here, we've got the things the as as yeah, yeah, sorry as the pressure decreases, the volume increases, which is just the opposite. Quite simple. Um, so as we look here on the right of the little picture, we've got a, a yellow balloon here. Um, it's filled up with um, air, air at atmospheric pressure. Um, it takes up kind of one balloon. Um, once you go down to 10 meters, you've got two bar, um, which is taking up half a balloon. So the volume is decreased by half. And then down to 20 meters, it takes up a third of the volume. Um, this is very, it's quite important for us because obviously we've got air in our lungs. Um, so you can imagine that balloon is like your lungs. So if you were to breathe in at, at the uh, surface and then not breathe out again or do anything until you got down to 30 meters uh, or 20 meters, sorry, your lungs would be a third of the size. Um, but we don't need to worry so much about the compression. We, for, as a dive, as divers, we are more worried about the expansion of the air when we come up. Um, so we have air, say, in our lungs, we've got a lung full of air at 20 metres. Um, by the time we get to 10 metres, that is now more than a lung full of air if, you've hold, if you hold your breath. So you, your lungs can be stretched, expand, maybe even kind of burst, which is kind of a, a worst case scenario. So the, one of the golden rules when you're diving um, is don't hold your breath. So you just try and relax and not hold your breath. And most importantly, don't hold your breath at all when you're uh, ascending. So we've got a quiz. Um, if a diver is at a depth of 15 meters, what is the water pressure? So normally, do this in person, we would uh, have it uh, have a question answer, but it's a bit harder to do it here. Um, so if it's at 15 meters, I'll give you a minute to think, um, so we'll work it out. Um, Yeah, it's not too hard, so I'll just kind of start moving on. It might be a bit pushed for time later. Um, so the total pressure from the water is 1.5 bar. And the absolute pressure is therefore going to be 2.5 bar, um, as you've got the one bar from the atmosphere on when you, from the uh, air above the water. If it descends to 25 metres, your absolute pressure is going to go up to 3.5 bar so you can just follow that down to any depth you want basically it's to say it doesn't change as you get deeper um it's useful um so i don't know how many of you have done uh, snorkeling before um well and those of you who are in the pool as well last week you'll recognize one of these it's just a mask that allows you to see underwater um they have a rigid frame so they're quite sturdy and they don't move around um when you're like doing it squished, which is like your normal swim goggles can. Um, tempered glass, which is strong and kind of withstands the pressure from all the water. Um, it's, you can you want to make sure you get a tempered glass one because the plastic ones are more likely to crack and bend and break. So try and stick just to tempered glass if you can. Um, if you need them, they can come with prescription lenses. So you, if you have to wear glasses for example or contact lenses you can not have to worry about that and you can just wear your mask um, and you'll still be able to see um 
just around the edge here, you probably would have noticed it than before, I have a flexible seal. So that kind of squishes to your face and stop the water coming in. Well, I'm supposed to stop the water coming in. Um, nose pocket for your nose, uh, adjustable strap on the back. So you can change it on the sides to make sure it's not too tight and squeezing your face or not too loose and allowing water to come in. That's the fit. Um, yeah, as I said, just put it, I make sure you don't want it too tight. So it's squeezing, but you want to make sure it's not allowing water to come in. Uh, with the care of them, you just kind of want to look after them. And when you've got your own one from Go Dive, um, just make sure they're clean and so not like right. when you go into like the sea, for example, we won't be doing it so much now. But once you start diving in the sea, you might get salt drying on it. You need to clean that off and then so it doesn't doesn't damage your mask. Um, it's quite a useful thing to make sure to do. And at the moment, uh, I think we're disinfecting the club ones between uses, obviously, because of uh, COVID. Um, so yeah, rinse them in fresh water to wash them off and then dry them before storing. So the other main part of uh, snorkeling equipment is your fins. Um, fins allow you to move underwater a lot quicker and a lot more easily than without them. Um, they are normally have two styles. So you've got your shoe fin, which a lot of people call a pool fin. Um, and then you've got your strap fin, which is your kind of open water fin. Um, the it's kind of you might be using a shoe fin say in open water if you're in a warm country um for example so they're not just designated to the pool um you can you might see them in warm countries um obviously there's a strap fin you'd wear a boot and it straps onto the back of your boot and stays in uh and then shoe fin you know, just pull over your shoe over your feet they've got flexible blades which allows them to kind of push the water out of the way and move you along much better and much quicker They've got the ridges in them so that they don't just act all floppy and flick around the water without doing anything. They actually push the water and they're shaped to be the most efficient as possible. Yeah, so as I said, they've got a foot pocket, um, either for your foot to go into uh, or your boot to go into. And then again, with just like your mask, rinse them with fresh water and dry them before storing, just makes your gear last longer. Um, so you have to spend less money on it, um, which was a good thing, especially your students. The other part of the snorkeling equipment is the snorkel. Um, after breathing at the surface, features the tube that allows you to breathe. Um, they're about 40 to 45 centimetres long, 20 millimetres in diameter, self-draining valves at the bottom, uh, and the fits, they have a mouthpiece that you can bite onto to kind of hold in your mouth. Again, rinse in fresh water and dry before story. We uh, a lot of divers you'll see some some have snorkels, but a lot of them don't have snorkels. Uh, we as a club and mainly as BZAC as an agency, we don't use them. Um, you'll see a lot of them maybe when you go away for Paddy. Paddy will be using them, um, but as kind of as divers get even Paddy divers get more experience, they often often ditch the snorkel. It's the main reason is just for uh, conserving gas when you're on the surface on the surface so you can still breathe your face underwater without breathing off your cylinder um, and saving the water for when you actually get under the water. So it's saving the air for when you get under the water, sorry. So when you're breathing underwater, here we go. So depth, you're on the surface, you're one bar, 10 bar, 10 meters, two bar, 20 meters, three bar. So if a diver is using snorkeling equipment, they will breathe in the uh, air and hold it in their lungs from the surface. And as I said earlier, that will get kind of compressed as they descend to half its volume at 10 meters and a third of its volume at 20. Now, if you're using scuba equipment, which is what we're all here to use, that's kind of the plan anyway, to get uh, qualified to be using it, uh, you breathe the gas that's at the pressure around you. So whereas at, with the snorkeling, you keep the air at one bar, um, as you go down, because it's now at two bars, say when you reach 10 meters, it's not being compressed. So it stays at the same volume, which is quite, uh, you need to keep an eye on that for when we're descending, as I said, uh, as when you're ascending, sorry, as I said earlier. Um, so that when you get to 20 meters, it's the same volume, but at three times the pressure. So scuba equipment, you will, should all, well, you might all be familiar with it from tri dives. Those who didn't come to the tri dives, you'll see it tonight. Um, it's 
when you first see it, it looks kind of scary and it's really complicated and you're wondering how it works, but we'll slowly introduce you and explain each piece as we kind of use it. And you actually find that the club kit is relatively simple. Um, once you've used it and seen it a few times, it kind of comes second nature to set it up and everything. Um, so you shouldn't need to use the video every week. So SCUBA sound actually is an acronym. An acronym, it stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. So it's a bit of trivial knowledge, might come up in a pub quiz or something at some point. Um, it's quite, a, it, a lot of people don't realise that, but yeah, I didn't realise that when I started diving, um, that it's actually an acronym. acronym. So it's got main, the main components of your scuba gear are your cylinder, which is not tank, we kind of call it cylinder. I mean, I mean you might get the old divers or people getting annoyed at you for saying tank, but it's not a big deal. Um, uh, there we go. Buoyancy compensator or BC. Um, that allows you to change your buoyancy of depth so you can um, sink when you need to sink or float come up when you need to come up um, without having to fin excessively hard. So that's a very useful part of the kit, as is the regulators. It's what you breathe from. It's what takes the air from your cylinder to your mouth. Um, so that's quite an important part of your kit. Um, we'll start looking at the cylinder. Normally, if we're doing this in the classroom, we'll probably have a, the whole kit with us and we can show you and point to it. So it's a bit more difficult tonight, uh, but bear with us. Um, we'll, we'll try and point it out tonight in the pool. If, there's, if you've got any questions about the kit, we can go through it later. Um, so it contains your gas at uh, high pressure normally made of steel or aluminium um, the club ones are all steel they're heavier as than aluminium um, they've got their pros and cons um, they've got the BSEN standard which is just kind of the testing standard I think it's, I think it's the testing standard I think that's what it's called uh, that is just making sure the cinder will do its job um, and to make sure it does its job as well it gets tested every five years hydrostatically so that is where um, the testing center will take your cylinder and they'll fill it up over the pressure that you would normally fill it up to when you're breathing from it um, and they basically see whether it moves around um, and whether whether it expands more than it should so it's got a limits where it should stay within um, and if it exceeds that it will fail the test that's every five years and visual they just have a look around to make sure it looks all good that's done every two and a half years so you'll do a visual test and then you often do a visual and a hydrostatic test and then a visual test. Um, again, so you need to keep your cinders in test basically. To, so we're at the club, uh, the kit store, we, we look after the cinders, but once you uh, left the club and you've got your own kit, you need to look after that yourself. And it's also quite good because you can check whether um, the kit that you're using, the cinders you're using when you go away and are diving somewhere else uh, are all kind of tested. So again, to look after them, again, it's just a case of rinsing in fresh water and drying them. And also with cinders, oh, with cinders uh, we, you don't want to store them empty. Um, you want to make sure there's pressure in the cylinder so that it, it just prolongs the life of it and makes, uh, makes them last longer. Was, go ahead, Barney. Sorry, just before you move on, can anyone tell me what we're looking for with the visual inspection on the inside of the cylinder what what would be what would we be worried about if we saw it on the visual inspection any cracks or damage to the cylinder yeah absolutely you'd be you'd be uh, pretty unlucky to find a crack in all honesty because if you've got a crack uh it will probably fail before you do a visual inspection um there's one thing that tends to happen when metal gets involved with water that is really quite a problem especially for the steel cylinders anyone got any ideas rust yeah jordan's got it so if a cylinder is rusted the structural integrity of that cylinder is then compromised so why would we store the cylinder with pressure in it to avoid rust how would that help Anyone got any ideas? Yeah, so when you've got pressure in the cylinder, 
that's just forcing the water out. So if we have an empty cylinder in the water, water will tend to go into the valve and into the cylinder, and then you get a rusty cylinder. So that's why it's so important to store them with pressure in them and not empty. Just thought I'd, uh, I'd add that on the end. Yep. Cheers for that, Barney. Quite a nice little bit of knowledge. Um, when you look at your cylinder, they have markings on them. Um, so this is kind of so you can look at a cylinder yourself and check uh, that it's all up to standard. So different cylinders will be um, certified for use with different breathing gases. So they'll either be certified for use with air, so 20, which is 21% oxygen, or you get something called nitrox, which is a higher percentage oxygen, so 32 or 36%. Um, it's kind of, I think the difference is the nitrox ones just have to be a bit more clean um, because of the higher oxygen content. Uh, it's they're more susceptible to rust, I think, and to um, they just more, I think it might be more flammable as well because the oxygen, but it, again, you just need to make sure that you're using the right cylinders. Um, they will have markings and labels on them, so that whether to tell it. So this is here on the screen now, uh, the kind of markings you'll get. Um, so that shows it's compressed gas, um, which are not for breathing. And then it says the compressed gas sign in the green one, the flammable thing that is in the yellow. Uh, and then you've got the mixtures. So they'll be certified for different mixtures of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. So there's obviously, there's, I said breathing gas and nitrox. There's a third one called trimix, but that's kind of very uh, technical gas and that's putting helium into it so that we won't get onto that um we'll get to that eventually at some further stage in your scuba careers um there's also the last column there called mod so that is the maximum operating depth um that you can breathe that uh, gas at you'll come on to why um you can't breathe certain gases at certain depths kind of later on in the course um but it's basically you're looking at the oxygen becomes poisonous once you've got uh, too much of it and um, as the pressure increases even though the percentage of oxygen stays the same because you're breathing in more you're actually breathing in more oxygen um, because of the pressure and then oxygen becomes toxic at, a certain, toxic at a certain point so just keep an eye on the maximum operating depth the MOD to make sure you're going to be safe. Um, uh, Cinder will also have these markings um, so that first marking is the BSEN 50457. That is the certification um, number. Um, you've then got 12 litres, so that's a 12 litre cylinder. Uh, the WP232 stands for working pressure 232. So that means you can fill the cylinder when to breathe from up to 232 bar. Um, so 232 times the pressure of the atmosphere um, and that obviously allows you to breathe it for longer and then you've got the TP348 that stands for testing pressure 348 so as I said earlier with the hydrostatic testing they fill it up uh, overfill it with the air so that it expands and they can see how much it expands by the pressure that they fill it up to for that test is 348 um, for this cylinder um, just kind of has a different um, different usage and um, allows you to make sure it's in the safe. And the final one there is the test dates. Um, so that is when you know you need to go and get it tested again. Um, yeah, so cylinders with nitrox, they have to be cleaned because of the higher oxygen content, um, but you don't need to worry too much about that. Um, we don't dive a lot with nitrox as a club, especially kind of because it's expensive to get fills, whereas we can fill compressed air for free and um, with our compressor. Um, so these are the valves on the um, cylinders. So the cylinder, there's a few different types of valves. You've got the A clamp, uh, which is what the club regulators are um, and most of the club cylinders. It looks like that picture there. It's kind of a hole with an O-ring um, that the uh, regulators kind of clamp onto and squeeze up and they, it looks like an A when they're clamped on. So those are normally only used up to 232 bar uh, for safety reasons, but they're, they're very safe to be using. They've been used for uh, many, many years. They've kind of been the standard for a long time. 
Uh, more recently, though, they've been bringing in a system called DIN as well. Um, it's What's good about DIN is it can be used for higher pressure cylinders. So a lot of tech divers and people who want to take more air with them uh, will use a DIN cylinder so they've got more air. Um, and then a lot of regs use them as well. Um, now, even if you've got your, they don't have to be technical regs or anything, you can buy standard ones that have uh, DIN fittings. And so then you kind of just screw it in and then you screw it in a bit tight and you feel it uh, when how tight it gets and then it stays there rather than have to clamp it on. Um, there's also a fitting called the M26. I personally don't think I've ever come across one. Um, so they're quite rare, I think. Um, and they're primarily used for nitrox cylinders. So the other part of the kit was your buoyancy compensator. Um, it supports the cylinder and holds the cylinder onto your back, controls your buoyancy so you can achieve that weightless feeling and feel like you're flying underwater. Um, and so the main features of them are the gas bladder, which is what you fill up with gas to change your buoyancy or uh, take the gas out to decrease your buoyancy. There's the direct feed, which comes from your cylinder. You've got the oral inflator, so if for any reason you don't want to use your cylinder or if you have a problem with your cylinder or your direct feed valve, um, you can inflate it uh, yourself, uh, breathing it, blowing into it. Um, so you take out your regulators and then blow into it. Uh, but you'll, you'll see how to do that in the uh, pool sessions. We'll show you about all about that. Not That isn't tonight, but you'll come across that eventually. Um, you've got the dump valve so those of you who came to the tri dives would have seen or have been showed that the end of your uh, the way you can put the air in there's also a button to take the air out um so there's a dump valve there that allows you to reduce your buoyancy and sink um there's also dump valves kind of on your kidney or your shoulder they have like little, uh, almost like toggle things that you can grab onto and pull and it allows the air to come out um However, with the relief valve, so with the dump valves, um, air will flow to, in the BC to the highest point. So if you're trying to use, say, the one on your kidney and low down on your back, it might not allow the air to come out because the air is all at the top of the uh, buoyancy compensator. Um, so you might want to use then the uh, uh, dump valve on the hose, which you can put above your head and then all the air flows to it. Um, We've also got the overpressure relief valve, which just means if you fill up your uh, BC with lots of air, it's not going to go bang. Uh, it just lets the air out um, without it popping and hurting you. Again, as with all kits, the care is rinse it with fresh water inside and out and dry uh, before storing slightly inflated. Um, you might also find, especially with the club ones, um, if you use them a lot, um, water might get inside them so just when you kind of hang them up or after you've rinsed them just kind of squeeze them and pull some of the valves and dumps just to make sure there's no water left um and again just as with um a lot of kits you just want to make it serviced uh, make sure it's serviced so that it's nice and safe and it's not gonna go wrong on you uh, so this is the regulators there's a picture there and um, you'll see those hopefully on the video and hopefully tonight as well it delivers your breathing gas so you can breathe underwater basically um the key features are the first and second stage so the first stage is what clamps onto your cylinder um and that is the main that changes the pressure and regulates the pressure so that it's kind of at your more it's lower pressure when you're higher up in the water when you get deeper so the, the water becomes the air coming out of there is at a higher pressure and then you've got your second stage, which is what you breathe from. Um, that does a bit more pressure change as well, but most of it's done by the first stage. So you're, that's what you'll get used to seeing and handling and looking at, looking at and using as you dive. You've got the hoses, which connects everything together. So you've got there uh, the direct feed hose. Um, so that's kind of what puts the air into your, your buoyancy jacket. Your alternative supply, the AS, that allows um, your buddy to breathe off if they ever have problems with their own set, own cylinders and their own uh, kit. So that you'll be trained to use that um, off someone else's cylinder, um, but it's a very, it's kind of a last resort. Um, they're very, very rarely used. Um, and then you've also got the content slash pressure gauge or your SPG. Um, 
that just tells you how much air you've got left in your cylinder. So that's quite a useful thing to keep looking at and making sure you've got air left. So you've got the types of regulators, the cold water, typically for less than 10 degrees water, uh, nitrox ones for the higher oxygen content uh, gas, and then again, care as of anything, you rinse them in fresh water and you dry them before storing. They've also got, I don't know if it says on here, but you can might be able to see on that first stage, there's a, and you'll see tonight as well, there's a dust cap on them. Um, so we put the dust cap on them so that the dust and moisture doesn't necessarily get inside them when they're being stored and they're not connected to the cinder because um, that's not good news for them. Um, so just make sure you put when you finish them with them or you take them out or well, take them off your cinder or you swap them over for any reason just to put the dust cap back on. Just keep uh, prolong, prolongs the life of them. Um, and again, as with uh, all kit, you need to make it sure it's serviced to reg uh, regular intervals. So weights, um, a lot of you, some of you may have used weights in the pool, some of you may not have used weights. Basically what they do is they help you sink. So if for some reason you get rid of all the air in your jacket and you still can't sink, you'll need some more weights uh, and it allows you just to go underwater. Um, so there are different types of ways of carrying the weight. So there's a weight belt, which is what we mainly have as a club for in the kit store. Um, so you'll see those and you'll probably use those as well, especially in open water when you're wearing wetsuits. You've got the weight harness, which is kind of just a harness that's got pouches that the weight goes into. So it's a bit more comfortable. Um, and then you also get integrated weights. So there's weights inside your BC that um, allow it to be heavier and allow you to sink. But you can remove them and um, they all have quick release mechanisms so that in the event of not in an emergency, for example, underwater where you need to get to the surface quickly or you can't for some reason, um, you can just ditch the weights and use the put in, using the quick release mechanism and then you'll just shoot to the surface. Uh, you'll learn why shooting to the surface isn't a good idea uh, eventually, um, but it's kind of there if it is the last thing you can do and you need to get to the surface quickly, um, but try and avoid using it basically. Um, so trim is how you're lying in the water. So uh, the good, what's called good trim is when you're kind of lying on your completely flat on almost on your stomach. Um, and a bad trim is kind of when your feet are down or your feet are up and you're kind of not horizontal. Um, you can change that by where you position the weight. Um, so it's something you just get used to. And once you've used it a long time and used it a while, you can kind of work out what works best for you um, to make your trim the best. Um, and with care, you wash again, wash them in fresh water and dry before storing. So the using scuba equipment slide. Um, this is the warning I kind of mentioned briefly earlier. Scuba uh, delivers breathing gas at the ambient pressure that you're at. So you will want to try and breathe normally at all times. Although you're kind of at the surface breathing normal air, it's just it's the safest way to do it um, and it's kind of what you should get used to doing and it once you become more comfortable underwater if you're not doing it to begin with you'll kind of be breathing normally uh, much more if you're breathing normally and you ascend without so if you're not breathing normally and you ascend the air in your lungs might expand um, as I said earlier and that's not good as that can damage your lungs and eventually if you go too high uh, your lungs go bang, uh, which, yeah, might be uh, quite a bad idea. So this is what buoyancy is that you might just kind of a lot of self-explanatory. Um, the water, where water displacement occurs when an object is placed in the water. So it's displacing the water. So seeing that slide here, I'll show it again. If you want to watch the water on the right, as the object goes in, and um, the water is displaced and goes up. So the volume that the uh, board is now taking up, the water that was there has been displaced to above where the water height was before. The water then has a, is act, the water is then acting a force onto the object um, upwards and to, because it's been pushed, the water's been pushed away. So it's pushing back on the, the object. And this uh, force is buoyancy. Um, the force depends on 
density, so objects sink when they are heavier and then the water is the place that's more dense, more dense than the water. Um, objects float when they are lighter than the water has been displaced. Um, so our aim as divers is to become either heavier when we want to sink or lighter um, when we want to float and ascend or the same weight as the water if we want to just stay at the same level. So and there we go. As divers, we've got something called mutual buoyancy, which is weightless. It feels like you're flying. It's amazing. Um, it's the best part, way to do it because, again, it reduces the physical effort. You don't have to try and keep yourself at a certain depth. Um, it just happens because you're buoyancy. So it's nice and uh, easier for you as divers. So that is a picture of positive, positive buoyancy. Um, so the guy here has inflated his jacket or a bit too much and it's kind of pulling him up um, and he's quite he's finding it hard to get flat so he's too light so he won't sink it's physically tiring um, and it pulls you upwards uncontrollably and then negatively buoyant um, is when you're too heavy and this guy's obviously you can see, sunk to the bottom and he the only thing that's stopping him going deeper is the uh, seabed or the bottom of the, uh, the water the that's uh, the bottom of the uh, lake maybe he's in um, so you don't want that because if you're say doing it on a reef and you're scraping along the reef um, you're damaging um, the coral or if you're in a wreck for example you might be get pulling along um, and scraping and damaging the wreck or even if you're just in normal like a normal open water scenario you might be um, kind of dragging along on the silt that's on the bottom and if you're dragging along the silt it uh, kicks up uh, into the water and makes it much harder to see where you are. And it's also, again, physically tiring and the you know, risk of going too deep. And damage to yourself or the marine life, like coral. And uh, also when you reach the surface, you will still sink, um, which we don't want. So when we get to the surface, we want to stay at the surface so rather than trying to be neutrally buoyant we actually want to be positively buoyant so we fill up our bcs so we float around and uh without having to thin so your buoyancy in practice when you're descending um your diving suits and scuba gear normally cause positive buoyancy at the surface so wet so as you when you go into open water you'll find that you'll be using a wetsuit um rather than kind of swim shorts or a t-shirt for example that uh, wetsuit will want to make you float so you'll need more weight when you go to stony and go to open water stuff so you add the weight to achieve neutral buoyancy and then when you're during the dive you change as you get deeper because the air is compressed the buoyancy um, properties of the air change so you need to compensate for that by putting more air into your buoyancy aid or oops, so buoyancy compensates your bc um, or as you get more advanced, you'll be using a dry suit and you put air into, you can put air into your dry suit instead of your jacket. And then you can fine tune it. So if you're kind of uh, swimming along and you've kind of come across a rock that you want to go over, you don't have to fill up your jacket and then to go over it and then deflate it. You can take a, like, hold a big breath in and as you take that breath in, more air is going into your lungs and makes you a bit more buoyant. So you float up over it and then as you breathe out, as you go over it, um, you descend um, as you become less buoyant. Uh, on the ascent, the gas will expand. Um, so to stop your, if as the air in your jacket expands, it becomes more buoyant. How, so we don't want to be overly buoyant as we're coming up because we'll go, we'll come up too quickly, uh, which isn't what we want. We want to come up at a controlled rates, so not, not come up too fast. And we do this by getting rid of the air in our jacket. So um, you use that dump valve on the hose above your head, as you can see on this photo here, the guy on the right is holding this dump valve above his head and letting the air out as he ascends. Um, what we do as well is a buoyancy check. So what it basically is, is it allows you to work out, you've, make sure you've got the correct amount of weight on. Um, and it's just a case of basically breathing all a big breath in um, and fully deflating your jacket and you should just start sinking um, or to the kind of the water then at your chin um, and then when you breathe out you go underneath the water that's what that's a buoyancy check and we do that like kind of every time you're diving in new conditions or with new equipment it's a good idea to do that 
So also with water, as your body temperature and your and the heat loss is quite an important thing we need to consider. Um, so the core body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Um, however, the water we'll be diving in is often a lot colder, um, especially at Stony. It gets bloody freezing there. Um, ridiculously freezing. Um, but we the heat is lost more uh, quickly to colder surroundings as well. Um, so we need to kind of work, maintain that and make sure it doesn't happen um, because it reduces the blood supply to the extreme, your extremities, um, which um, in, therefore reduces the heat loss, so it increases uh, heat loss. Um, I think, yeah, so it, yeah, so it stops the blood going to your fingers. You can't feel your fingers uh, basically which is not a good thing. Um, signs and symptoms, yeah, blue slash numb extremities, so your fingers, you can't feel them, your toes, you can't feel them. Um, not a good sign of your shivering um, as well. If you get quite cold, your body's trying to warm itself up. Um, and then eventually it can lead to hypothermia, which we do not want because that can be quite bad. Um, so the reason why it's such a problem and thing we have to look out for when we're diving is because in water, your heat loss is 25 times faster than it is in the air because the uh, water is a better conductor of heat. And um, so it pulls you all the heat away from your body quicker. So we, rather than just wearing the clothes that we would wear on the surface, um, we have to wear to certain insulation. So depending on the water temperature, we need to, might need to wear different insulation. Um, and if you're getting cold, um, just end the dive if, you're getting, if you really are getting cold because it's better to miss out on a one dive or miss out on half of a dive even um, than get hypothermia and suffer the consequences of that. Um, so the insulation type comes normally in wet, so in a few different types of suits. The, the first ones we'll look at are wet or semi-dry suits. So you might be familiar with wetsuits. Um, they're a neoprene fabric. Um, they're close fit to you. They're quite comfortable. Um, come in one or two piece. Uh, semi dries are basically thicker wetsuits and they have seals on the neck and the ankles and the wrists to kind of stop the water that is then inside them from coming out because if you're in a wetsuit or semi dry, your body heats up the water between your body and the neoprene. Um, whereas, so when you're if you're constantly losing that and it's getting flushed through the suit because of bad seals, um, your body is then losing water, losing heat, trying to heat up that water which is next to it. We also wear hoods and gloves, um, another way to keep warm, um, and then boots rather uh, with strap fins rather than just going barefoot with the uh, sock fins we saw earlier. Wetsuits and semi dryers care again with as with most kits, wash it with fresh water and dry it before storing. As we get more advanced and maybe even we might even get some club ones, there's uh, dry suits. Um, so a lot of us more experienced divers have them. Um, they keep you much warmer because they keep you dry. So basically what they entail is rather than using just the suit to keep you warm, you can wear clothes underneath it which keep you warm. Um, so then you can wear things called undersuits, which are it's like wearing a duvet, but wrapping yourself up in a duvet and then pulling your dry suit over the top and keeping it dry. And then you still get all the thermal quant uh, qualities of the uh, undersuit. So they come made of neoprene or membra membrane. The neoprene ones have their own thermal protection um, over the membrane, so you don't need to wear as much clothes underneath. Um, but it comes down to preference and uh, a few factors so you want to make sure it's got a comfortable fit um, they have seals to prevent the water from entering the suits to keep you dry there's a big zip on the back that is seal waterproof and stops the water coming in um yes yeah, so there's under suits to keep you warm you still wear hood and gloves um keeps your extremities warm you get you can get dry gloves um with a dry suit um so that keeps your hands warm as well uh, dry dry and warm so then you can wear woolly gloves and underneath. And again, you wash them in fresh water and you dry them before storing. And then you want to dust the seals so they don't tear or get damaged and lubricate the zip so it works and moves smoothly. So another quiz um, 
don't suppose if anyone's got any questions as well, you can ask them um, at this time. So the three main parts of a scuba set, um, give you a minute to think about that. Um, so we'll have a look. The answers will be uh, your cylinder, your BC and the regulators. Um, when breathing from scuba equipment, what must you never do? What's the, uh, the golden rule? And that is hold your breath um, for when you're ascending, uh, especially um, due to the change in pressure. And then while underwater, di divers should maintain what type of buoyancy? So the three types are positive, negative and neutral. And the one you want to maintain is neutral. There you go. Um, so understand, understand the significance of the physical effects of the diving environment. Uh, we've looked at the effects of depth and the pressure of these depth uh, that come along with these depths. We've looked at the snorkeling equipment. We've looked at scuba equipment. We've looked at buoyancy and how to maintain it and control it using your uh, BCD or buoyancy control device. We've looked at different types of thermal protection to make sure you don't get too cold when you're diving. Um, so that's just a quick summary of what we've done um, tonight. Now, this is the plan for this evening. Um, I don't know if Barney wants to jump in or and give some yeah, more details I'll, I'll about jump this. In. Cool. Um, so is everyone aware of what slot they're meant to be in for the pool tonight? Hands up if you are. I suppose probably the easiest way of doing this. Okay, that's most people. If you're not sure, you should have had an email that tells you which slot you're in. First slot, arrive at the kit store at 10 to 8. That's very clear. Uh, and then the second slot, you guys will meet at the pool, so outside the pool, at 9 o'clock. Does everyone know where the pool is to begin with? So anyone, or rather, does anyone not know where the pool is? Put your hand up. It's probably the easy way of doing it. I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, that's good. Our kit store, you should have received a link for Google Maps. If you're not sure, just go to the pool and we'll catch you at the pool. Uh, but if you know where the kit store is, just head to the kit store and we'll see you there at 10 to 8. Um, we need everyone to arrive beach ready like you did at the tri dive so you're ready just to take off a set of trousers or a coat and just jump in the pool um, first thing you'll be doing is swim tests so we'll take you to the far end of the pool you'll jump in and you have as long as you need obviously the faster you do it the faster you get in scuba gear and in the water um, you need to do eight lengths that's 200 meters which sounds like a lot but you can stop at either end and take a breather if you need to um, once you finish with that jump out and then you'll go with an instructor and do your scuba lesson. Um, it will be kind of half on the side of the pool, half in the water tonight, because there's a bit of kind of teaching you how the scuba kit works and everything on the side of the pool to begin with. Second slot, people, um, when you arrive, we'll get the uh, surface cover to come out and collect you. And then you'll be getting in doing your swim tests while the first group are finishing off their scuba lessons. Once they're out the way, you'll then go and do your scuba lesson. Um, if there's any questions, just either speak up now or chuck them in the chat. Uh, is the storeroom next to room one doors? I think it is, isn't it, James? Um, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Those are the doors that go into the back of room one. Uh, no, yeah. is it room one? Or was it the, was it the, that's the, it's room one, the cogs? It? Yeah. Is it not cogs? So I think is it's it not cogs. Well, I just go show how old we are, doesn't it? <laughs> I well, it's been so long. It's been what six it's, months since been the yeah, union. Yeah, it probably is, Mike. It's down the back of the union. Um, if you're struggling in the in the car park of the swimming pool, if you just keep going straight as you come at it from the security hut, you'll see a light with loads of people stood around it, probably. Um, or just yeah, 
yeah that pretty much that. if you if you just walk round the union in a circle you'll eventually find us again if you're struggling to find it just head to the pool and we'll see you over there um, uh, I'm in, I'm in the that? sorry say again is it next to the uh, there's like a bunch of AU stores? I think canoe used one. Uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Oh, I think I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it is. Head head there again. If you if you yeah. if we're not there and I've I've lied to you, then just head to the pool and we'll we'll catch you there. There's a big skip outside as well. Um, so you'll see that. You guys will get familiar with where the kit store is pretty pretty quickly. But for tonight, uh, it's a bit tricky to describe where it is. It's just at the end end of the car park basically, it's swimming pool car park right at the back. Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions at all about tonight? Anything at all? Gonna take that as a no, which is good. Um, right. Over to you, James. Mm -hmm. We've nice. done uh, pretty well on time, so it's pretty much seven o'clock. So yeah, that's the plan for this evening. Um, if Hopefully you guys will enjoy it and kind of understood uh, what we talked about tonight. Um, we'll go into a bit more depth tomorrow, uh, next week, same time, um, and we'll kind of keep building on it week on week um, to get the knowledge. Uh, there will be invites sent out, I think, on out on email. Um, if the times change, they shouldn't, um, but just check the invites to make sure that it's still at the same time. Um, Quite useful so yeah, that's the end of this um so we'll see you guys later just one more thing before people start disappearing um you guys like i said at the start of the lecture should have watched that assemble your scuba gear so if you haven't done that go and watch that video it is useful it's relatively quick um, and also you should have all bought bzac membership by now if you haven't done that Look at your emails. There's a video that shows you how to do it. Please do it now because we'll need you to have it for the pool session. Um, we've got a list of people who haven't shown up on our system and we'll be asking them to show us a uh, proof that they've done it because it is important for insurance reasons, unfortunately. So uh, if you haven't done that, please go and do that now. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So see you all at the pool. I'll catch down the kit store in a bit, Barney. I'm on my dinner. Yep, see you then. See you in a bit.